and we're recording that delayed though it, you know what don't worry because i think it delayed for me too so maybe maybe we won't be fucked you know what i'll be pleasantly surprised if we again are perfectly lined up i mean i keep saying that did i fuck it up last perfectly week perfectly lined up no wow i you said you did i thought i did and i said no you didn't because you said that last week and we were perfectly lined up and blah 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 and here we Behold. are here we are <laughs> <laughs> it's us greatness personified we're back again <laughs> did you miss us <laughs> welcome back to oddities kids i'm cassie i'm kelly and welcome back to strange town bum 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 do 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 and boom. of course as you know for those of you who are new, hi, welcome, hello, and if you don't know, we put in our description every week the links to our social media if you'd like to join along. Kids, we also have a Patreon if you'd like to donate, help some girls out. Uh, all of that goes towards making the show better in the ways that we yes. know how. So um, you can go as low as a dollar a month, although you know we appreciate donations at any level. And um, we have a merch shop, so feel free to check that out too. New merch coming New merch soon. merch coming. We just haven't had time, but we will. Soon. <laughs> soon. I have to get past a bachelorette party that I have coming up for a, a dear friend and now new listener. She's, <gasps> she's, she's checking in all the time now with her hubby. Hi, you. With her hubby to be. She loves it. She also sent along a couple of uh, topics for us, which have been added to the list, but it's going to take... A hot second Forever. before we get there, because we have so many <laughs> wonderful people who've written in, which is great. Um, so, yeah, anyway, kids, follow along on social media. Please donate to our Patreon if you can. Uh, you get a bonus episode every week so to continue the madness. And, yeah. And again, when you do subscribe, you get all the past chaos, too. <laughs> you do. So you can just binge. I mean, you could binge the ever-living shit out of it if you really want. I mean, you can just... If you truly want to like lose Just every witness. remaining brain cell that you have, you can do yep. that. And that's, you know, entirely up to you. So <laughs> that's your choice. We we support we support your we choices. We support you. Yeah. So. Cassie, I can't. The corgi is staring into my soul. <laughs> Don't you love it? She's referring I finally hung some shit up in my office. It looks amazing. it looks amazing. It looks amazing. If I do say so myself. It's very um it's like dark it's academia you. vibes, but not. It's cozy. It's me. It's a little quirky. It's a lot of fun, if I do say so myself. So here we are. No, it's it's totally you, but the corgi is totally staring my I soul, have, like, in a good way. I, I have a piece of artwork, and I found this, this dude on Etsy, which, like, snaps. Um, and he takes, like, dictionary pages and then puts prints, like, images or paintings or whatever on it. And I got this corgi wearing a crown. On a dictionary page, and I'm having very fitting for Cassie. <laughs> hanging up with a gigantic red clothespin. It's very cool, if I do say so myself. I love it. Thank you. It's it's so good. Art. I have another one that I'm gonna be hanging up here. It's a corgi astronaut, but I there wasn't room on that <laughs> wall, so it's gotta go on this wall. But yeah, um, how be how be ye, my bestie, this week? Oh. I transformed into a red lobster this week. <laughs> you look good. You look healed. Yeah, I fortunately, thanks to hyaluronic acid, moisturizer, coconut oil, all the all the stuff that moisturizes your skin, it turned into a tan. Thank God. You were just um, a you were just a um, slip and like a human slip and slide this week. I I quite literally was. I mean, like um, basically, you were oiled up, baby. I was so focused on. Uh, making sure my kits were lathered up in sunscreen that I forgot to, you know, do the same for myself. Good God. On vacation. Good God. Yep. And uh, we were in really high altitudes and you could burn really quick up there. And I was a walking evidence of that. So you were like, you were fortunately, like Icarus flying right into yeah. the sun. Fortunately, that happened on the very last day that we were there, so it oh, didn't good. happen at, like, you know, the beginning, 
So that was good. Like, it didn't ruin the whole vacation. Just, you know, the end. <laughs> <laughs> just the last day. <laughs> but it was a really fun, fun vacay. I, notable, <laughs> notable uh, thing from the vacation. After the first night, I messaged Cassie and I was like, this Airbnb is haunted. And she's like, of course it is. Because, like, it's you. Well, we have, and a, then we I have s- a theme with haunted yeah, Airbnbs. We, I mean, we, we do. We really do. And I sent her... I'm like, honorable mention of art in this freaking Airbnb. <laughs> Her response was, oh my God, it is haunted. That, it, was like the, it was like a Victorian child or something, wasn't it? I don't even remember what the fuck it was, but I saw it that was I was like, like a haunted. gothic bride. Haunted. It was, There's it not was even a question. The, the real life corpse bride, maybe? I'm not even 100% sure. We appreciate um, the vibes, but maybe a disclaimer when booking so the didn't Airbnb. It so belong in this cabin. Is haunted with all with with all the other art that was in the cabin and then it was just like down by the baseboards by the way oh like just why oh like why why yeah that, i mean i think that's a really good question why that's and above it, boogala. above it two photos of the twin towers oh why why well, I bet you any money that picture, like that that gothic bride shit, has to be. It's like it's probably like one of those things where, like, if you try to remove her from the house, like the picture just ends up inside the house again or some shit. It's like a Ouija board, but a painting. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like some crazy probably. shit like that. So like they just don't even have a choice. They're like, okay, well, this yeah. bitch has to stay. And while we're out of here, just went towers. She's permanently here now. Yeah. Um, right. So like, I got like not so great vibes, and then that following night, the first night being there. I had my first encounter with coyotes. They're freaky. I didn't know coyotes laughed. They do. And they were literally in the backyard of the cabin. Oh, yeah. And I fucking... thought I thought there was something laughing in the walls of this place. And I was like... You're like, I gotta listen. get the fuck out of here. You're like, this is vacation. <laughs> you leave. You leave. I'm here to relax. I had a moment where I was like, oh, is this sleep paralysis? <laughs> <laughs> and then I realized, no, I can move my arms. You're like, no, I'm awake. I, so where we used to live, we had this huge, we were right up against the woods, but we also had this mega field, like right by our house. And one night there was like, I guess what, what, like a pack of coyotes? What do you call them? Like, do they have like a fun, you know how it's like a murder of crows? I don't know. Is there like a fun name for a group of coyotes? I'll look it up. Coyotes. But regardless, I literally turned to Corey one night and I was like, is somebody throwing a fucking rager in our field? It straight up (laughs) sounded like a bunch of like, I don't know, drunk teenagers or something. No, it was just the coy- Cordy's like, no, it's it's coyotes. I was like, oh, is it? They're called a band. A band of coyotes? <laughs> wow, if that's not fitting. You know what? I think that works. It is fitting, actually. I, that the noises they make. Mm-hmm. It's a regular hoot and nanny of coyotes. I love it. Damn. That's hysterical. I'm not, the more you know. Who says this podcast isn't educational? Consider yourselves edumacated. <laughs> edumacated. Edumacated. <laughs> so, yeah, it was a great time, though. Good. So, yeah, but how was your week? <laughs> My week was fine. Um, <laughs> it felt excruciatingly long for being a short week. Because there was a holiday in the middle of it, that's why. I, yeah, you know, I get, and I'm, like, fucked up. I, I always get fucked up when there's a holiday during the week. And it takes me, like, weeks to recover in terms of what day of the week it is. Mm -hmm. So I'm just, like, eternally thrown off. But it was good. Fourth of July was low-key. We went to, uh, let's see. Well, we celebrated my birthday, and that was fun. We went to a local baseball game, and we won, and there were fireworks, and that was fun. Saw the new Indiana Jones movie. That was great. And hung up a bunch of... It was great. I, I really enjoyed it. It was a nice... It was like a nice sign off. Um, And we hung up a bunch, you know, all this shit in my office. And I'm, I'm very pleased to say behind all of that shit, there's about six extra holes. So (laughs) nobody will know. And that's, um, I have some other, some other uh, big things cooking right now. I can't really talk about though at the moment. And um, yeah, so, you know, all good stuff all around. Love it. Yeah. You know what the I big thing it. you know what the big thing is that's cooking, but I I just can't. So yeah, no, I'm not pregnant. Everybody, so relax. 
Everybody relax. Everyone calm down. Everybody relax. We're not trying to do that yet. So everybody shut up. Yeah, that's what I what that's a, a little a little ditty. Um we are uncharacteristically short this morning. Ten minute intro <sighs> instead of our usual thirteen y, but you know what? That's okay. Thirteen y ooh a martini. Anyways. <laughs> <laughs> ooh a martini. <laughs> Look, Anywho, it's been a long week. Oh, and I got a haircut. <laughs> I have bangs now, but I have them. I have them tucked. I have, I've I, yet to actually get a picture of your I full new haircut. You. Yeah, I love it. She did a great job. I have curtain bangs now, but I have them. It's tucked up in my my headphones, so you can't. Yes. You can't know. You, I'll leave them down when we record our bonus tomorrow. Okay. Sounds I'll, good. Yeah, I have to do my hair for reasons, so <laughs> <laughs> we'll do that. But um. Yeah, I can't remember. It's been a second. Who went first last? Do you recall? I think it was me. I believe it was you. Yeah. It was you because I had to follow you again. All right, Jesus, <laughs> take the wheel. I was like, I'm nauseous. <laughs> Today, my friend, I'll follow you. Okay, well, I'm really excited about mine because I wasn't anticipating so much history. Ooh, history. Ooh, Italian and, hands. Um, and then as I was like getting into the paranormal... On mine, there was a turn of events that I was not expecting that oh. I did not find when I was researching the history. Oh, stunning! So a little, so I a was, little plot twist. It was it was quite the plot twist. So um, I'm actually re- I'm covering one of my favorite theaters in Ooh. Hollywood. Oh, none other than the Pantages. The Pantages. Yeah, I've never even Pantages fucking heard. theater. It's like contagious, but not. So, in the heart of Hollywood, on Hollywood Boulevard, ah. right down the block from Vine Street, stands the Pan- Hollywood Pantages Theater. Is this? Am I? Where have I been? Maybe I. Maybe I know this theater and I don't know it. It's in a lot of movies. Okay. But this theater has been around for nearly a century. It opened on June fourth, nineteen thirty. Oh shit! We're at we're so, at yeah. like ninety what ninety three years nineties. Yeah, 93 years. Wow. Yeah. Uh, and I bet she looks great. She is gorgeous. Aging like a fine in, wine. In my opinion, she is the most beautiful theater I've ever stepped foot in. Stunning. Um, okay. She has these most stunning ceilings. Ooh. Like, breathtaking, just stunning. Like Stunning! <laughs> oh, I love it. <laughs> I bet you, um, you know what I like about theaters is like the theater ghosts are always fucking like over the top. You know, I mean, they're all drama yeah. kids, right? So not all of them in this one. Oh, sorry. Oh, oh, the intro. But there is right. very one very dramatic one. But we will get to that in a minute. I'm going to cover the historical parts of it. Okay. Because there, this this theater, again, it's been around for nearly a century. So it's got some deep roots, uh, both historical and paranormal. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Ooh, okay, I'm excited. So, yeah. The Hollywood Pantages has a history as grand and diverse as the stage and screen fair, which audiences have flocked to who enjoy for nearly a century. With it being around for so long, it clearly has quite the fun history. But of course. Uh, when it opened, it was owned and run by Rodney and Lloyd Pantages, the sons of Alexander Pantages. Remember that name? Okay. Because that's where the plot twist had me with whiplash. <laughs> oh, shit. Okay. All right. Alexander. In 1932, it was sold to Fox West Coast Theaters. For a decade, it was primarily a movie house. And in 1949, uh, came Howard Hughes. Oh. Uh, acquiring the theater through RKO, changing its name to the RKO Pintagious, and setting up uh, offices there. His upstairs apartment and screening room are today's theater offices. Oh, cool. Which is kind of cool. He lived on the premises. Yeah. Um, Workaholic. In 1953, right. <laughs> <laughs> in 1953 began the Pantages television debut. The Oscars began to be hosted there. Oh, oh um, okay. All right. So. It's not hosted there anymore. Oh, It was only okay. hosted there for a short time in the 50s. Fuck. All right. Um, but it was hosted, and so... It, the Pantages was essentially brought into the living rooms across the U.S. and continued to do so throughout the 50s. Um, 
Pacific Theaters bought the Hollywood Pantages from RKO in December 1967, leading to a refurbishment and reopening the theater uh, sections closed down during the Hughes reign. The much anticipated music theater raised nearly four hundred thousand dollars. Oh shit! Um, this is where I thought was wild because in 1967, okay. they sold tickets for two hundred and fifty dollars per seat to premiere the uh, viewing of Cleopatra. Shut up. Cause that's a lot of money now. That's a lot of money now, but then, but then yeah, exactly. No, I mean like, like what that, crap. what the equivalent is to now. It's yeah. Probably, yeah. Right. Holy shit. So, right. Damn. I was like, kind of like, whoa. Um, but Gasp. that, yeah. Right. <laughs> um, do, 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 do. Why is it not scrolling? Sorry. Uh, in 1977, the Nederlander organization came in as Pacific's partner and gave the Hollywood Pantages another overhaul before reopening as its legit as a legitimate theater with a bubbling brown sugar in February. <laughs> that was that the, that was the name of a film. Uh, yeah, that was the name of a film or a show. I'm not 100 percent sure the which. What the fuck? Okay, <laughs> whatever that was. Um, when the Nederlander organization heard that the Walt Disney Corp, uh, Company was seeking a home for its Los Angeles production of The Lion King, oh. Chairman James M. Nederlander locked up the Pantages booking by agreeing to substantial renovation. It was time that, um, and he thought that it was the theater was looking more like it needed to look more like it did in 1930, and it restored it to its original luster in time for the highly anticipated premiere of the Disney's Lion King. So, oh my God, we love a refurb. And, That's great. Yeah, so it refurbished back to its original its glory. original glory yes. in the 1930s. Why would they ever have changed it is my question, but that's fine. They were trying to like update too. You know what? I just like, I well, you know me. I have a soft spot for history. History. Yeah. History. History. <laughs> history. <laughs> I was going to say historical structures, but it came out history. <laughs> Uh. while the pantages has hosted many notable shows throughout its reign um i have to say the first time i visited the pantages i was completely left speechless uh the first time i went to the pantages it was to see hamilton Ooh. uh. um i know that many notable shows have been there have been uh rent cats uh dream girls uh phantom of the opera the list goes on. That's a biggie. There's been, it's a biggie. People, it's rarely closed. Right, right. <laughs> um, the first time I visited, it, I was completely left speechless. This theater is stunning in its own way. Beautiful doesn't do it justice. Um, and I have to say, there is a spook factor. <laughs> I bet. Like, there is just something that... In my opinion, and I don't know if it's because I'm on this podcast. I don't know if it's because it's me. <laughs> there was a spook factor. <laughs> I believe it. Old theaters, like anytime I've gone to see some Broadway shows and like a lot of those take place in like very old theaters, like there's just an inherent like, ooh. Yeah. Spookala boogala. Like, there's, there's something spookala boogala there, right? Right. Um, so, of course, like I did some investigating. And... But of course. This is what I found. Dead um, people. It is believed that the Pantages has a handful of ghosts. Hell yeah. The first and most haunting being Alexander Pantages himself. Oh, Senor Pantages. Okay. <laughs> Alexander was a Greek American who actually opened more than 60 theaters across the U.S. Holy shit. All being Pantages theaters. I mean, like you do. That, yeah. That, like... But he had a great fa- ground downfall when it came to this one. Oh. This was his downfall. Um, oh, no. When he was allegedly falsely accused of raping a 17-year-old girl. Oh, shit. Okay. And he was put on trial a year before this Pantages opened and sentenced to 50 years in prison. Holy shit. I'm surprised they kept the name. Well, his sons ended up running i know but like yeah like there's that's a lot of scandal you know um he so he was sentenced to 50 years in prison for his crimes pantages 
engaged attorney Jerry Geyser uh, and a San Francisco lawyer, Jake uh, Elrich, to file an appeal on his behalf. The Pantages, uh, Alexander Pantages, uh, was acquitted in the, the second trial in 1931. So he was acquitted oh, okay. of his crimes. Okay, interesting. The damage had been done, though. Well, yeah, kind of, right? <laughs> yeah. Like, um, and due to financial burden, he sold. That's why he sold it in 1932. Wow, is this the plot twist you're talking yeah. about? Yeah, this was yeah, like that's a massive plot shit. twist. So he yeah. sold it for far less than what it was worth in order to pay his team. Many pol- people believe that his spirit is at unrest. Uh, well, because of his attachment to his prized possession, because this, he had big I plans mean, for this theater. I mean, okay. look at it now. Yeah, like it's yeah. Um, he ended up dying in 1936. Okay. And it is believed that he appears in the main floor of the building, maybe to greet guests, maybe to feel power, maybe to hold on what should have been his. Damn, well, we need to see a picture of this man and then just go to, like, a shitload of shows there, you know? Right. Um, the next popular spirit and ghost is that of an actress, of course. Of course. <laughs> Who <Actress>. died of... <laughs> from that 303 song, you know? I love you. <laughs> I immediately knew it. <laughs> Was for... I'm so glad you knew because I didn't give you much of a lead up there at all. No, that was perfect. <laughs> oh, gosh. My little emo heart. Anyways. <laughs> it just happened. It was just like a it's, reflex. It was perfect. <laughs> just carry on. Um, <laughs> the next ghost is or popular spirit is that of an actress who died a premature death in the mezzanine of the theater oh, no. due to an, an illness. She's oh, believed okay. to be stuck within the walls because she never got a chance to really showcase her talent. Oh no! But although she wasn't recognized in life as a tr- uh, uh, for her true talent, she certainly tries to be recognized now by singing. Oh, uh, stunning! That's right. She has been several witnesses, more than several witnesses, have reports of the singing ghost of the Pantages. So they just hear the singing? That's pretty fucking freaky. Like you're just hanging out there and all of a sudden some bitch starts laying down. Like, no. A lot of employees have reported this singing ghost. They have no idea who she is, who she was. Allegedly, she died in the 30s. Oh my, I wonder what the illness was. Right. Tuberculosis or some shit. Yeah. Um, but they're seeing through the auditorium. Wow. And they don't know where it's coming freaky. from. Uh, that's I, freaky. It's freaky. Would love to hear it though. Cause I'm curious. To yeah. know, I want to know what a singing ghost sounds like. So yeah. Also like, damn, just give her some recognition and maybe she'll just like buzz off, you know, standing ovation. Yeah. Get, damn. That was put great. Her to rest. <laughs> See you. And the final ghost drum roll, please. Howard Hughes. Oh, well, he had his apartment there and whatnot, yep. right? So This should come to no surprise. As I mentioned earlier, he lived above the Pantages. Um, although he did not die there, it is reported that he was one of, this was one of his favorite places. And it's often reported that he visits. Oh, that's happy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's happy. He okay. visits the theater from time to time. And people often say that figures and apparitions of a man it appear from what used to be his apartment and screening room. Employees employees will often say they get this the cold chills from often time to times in those rooms oh, as well. Oh, mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. And Classic Bukala. Yeah. He likes to chill and hang out. <laughs> Wow, I do like that for him. It's like yep. his happy place. That's cool. I so, feel bad for the other two. Right? Um, and that is the Pantages. I love that. That was great. Well yes. done, you. Wild to me that that whole criminal history with Alexander didn't come up until you started looking into like paranormal shit and whatnot. Yeah, um, because I, there were several articles that I was reading on the history of the Pantages, right? And yeah. I like that it was conveniently left out. Yeah, right. And it's like, well, hello, this is part of the history. Like, And, and it is a part of the history because he is the original owner. 
Yeah. And I do find it interesting that with such a a serious criminal history, may I add, yeah. it was like I'm surprised that it was able to keep the name. From, you know what right? I mean? Right? Like Yeah. I'm surprised that the Pentagus was able to keep its name, especially this long. I can't well, I imagine like, it I as any other that... name. <laughs> Yeah, like, I kind of figured they would have, like, tried to just, like, be like, okay, rebranding time. Like, I don't know, it's just kind of, why not the Hughes Theater? You know what I mean? Or something. Yeah, or I'm surprised that when Fox bought it in uh, 1932, that they didn't change the name. Because it was still widely in the news. His criminal history followed him. It didn't matter that he was acquitted. It followed him and haunted him. Um, Yeah. They believe that he because he died in his 60s they believed he died fairly early because yeah of the stress right. of this um i have to say i don't know how i feel about um uh, i i read in on the case i don't know how i feel about the case i didn't exactly particularly love what was written um yeah well i mean it wouldn't be um surprising to me if he did that and then was able to I'll be acquitted of it. Like it, it yeah. wouldn't surprise me. Given yeah, especially time. in that time. Yeah. 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 Um, it was just certainly interesting. Like, because reading the history of things, it was only bringing up his sons as the owners and the people who ran the Pantages. And then later, you know, reading the paranormal side of it, it was like Alexander Pantages was like, "Well, who is this dude?" <laughs> yeah. You know. And then I'm like, yeah, "Wait a like, minute, who the fuck? Wait a minute." Yeah. Um, he's the actual owner essentially it was it's it it's interesting how convenient this has all been um nicely covered up yeah history is history no matter which way you want to dress it up i know Um, It's, it's what it is history has a very ugly side of it sorry people that's the way it is um and no matter way which way you want to sugarcoat it you can't you can't cover up the ugly parts too. Yeah. History is also inherently biased, right? Depending right. on who gets to tell it who, <laughs> and what documents are available. And, you know, so one of my favorite books um, that I'm only a quarter of the way through so far, cause it's just so much to unpack uh, lies. My history teacher told me. Oh, good. Oh, I like that. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> I believe it. I'm sure it is. I think I've heard of that too. Um, well, that was that was a great topic. Well done. Thank you. I love that. Yeah, we love spooky theaters here on oddities. Audit, oddities. Um, I have an entirely different direction for us. All right. A little bit of history too. It's it's a figure. It's a woman. We All love, right. We love we this. love this. So this this is from listener Emily. Thank you, Emily. We appreciate Hi, Emily. you. Hi, Emily. Uh, Hi. This is Frances Glessner Lee. She. Excuse me. She is known as the mother of forensic science. <gasps> I love that. Right? Okay. Brace yourselves, kids. It's not super long. It's not super crazy detailed, but there's some interesting fucking shit. And anyway, it's about her nutshell miniatures as well. So, Frances Glessner Lee was the first female police captain in the United States. Ah. We love it. Yes. We love it. And like I said, she's considered the mother of forensic science. She helped to found the first of its kind Department of Legal Medicine at Harvard University when the field of forensics was a wee little baby. Um, At the time, there was like basically little to no training for investigators, basically meaning that they overlooked or mishandled key evidence all the time. They irrevocably tampered with crime scenes without even knowing it because they just, you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. So... Um, few of those investigators had any medical training that would allow them to determine cause of death. And so as Lee and her colleagues at Harvard worked to change this whole sort of paradigm, tools were needed to help trainees scientifically approach this like search for truth, right? So she, Frances, was a talented artist as well as being a criminologist. And so she used the craft of miniature making that she had learned when she was a little girl to solve this issue. So she just made these crazy these crazy miniatures, and they were called the nutshells, which is short for nutshell studies of unexplained death. Same. (laughs) Anyway, she made these things called the nutshells, and they were like 
highly, highly, highly detailed dioramas, basically, of true crimes. And they would go on and, like, like use them to train people. So let me, let me talk about this a little bit more. So she started building the nutshells in, like, the 1940s to teach investigators to properly canvas a crime scene to effectively uncover and understand evidence. And it was basically like, if you want to think about it this way, the equivalent to virtual reality in their time. Mm -hmm. So she would masterfully like craft these dioramas um, with handmade objects to render scenes with exacting accuracy and like meticulous detail. And every element of the dioramas from like the angle of the tiny, tiny little bullet holes to the placement of latches on windows, patterns of the blood splatters, the discoloration of like just these painstakingly painted miniature like corpses. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> basically it challenged these trainees powers of observation and deduction and they are so effective that they are still used in training seminars today at the office of the chief medical examiner in baltimore <gasps> that's Salty cool Balti, a place special to my heart yeah so anyway the nutshells represent composites of real and extremely challenging cases featuring homicides suicides accidental deaths and Frances imagined and designed each setting herself. And she was both, uh, like I said, exacting, but also highly creative in her pursuit of detail. Like she knitted tiny little stockings by hand with straight pins. She hand rolled tiny little, tiny little like cigarettes and like burning, she burned the ends. And then she wrote these tiny little letters with a single hair paintbrush. She created working locks for the windows and doors. It's crazy. And I so love as- what you're doing with your hands right now. <laughs> These tiny little knitting socks. I know. And as the nutshells are still active training tools and they like the solutions to every nutshell, they remain a secret, right? Um, however, crime scene reports written by Francis Lee to accompany each case um, are given to forensic trainees and they're presented alongside each diorama to encourage like people who now visit, because sometimes these are like showcased in museums. So people who now visit the nutshells as a way like to, to view them in the way that an investigator trainee would. So... Let's talk about Frances herself a wee bit. She was born in Chicago in uh, 1878, March 25th. Her father was John Jacob Glessner, and he was an industrialist who became like very wealthy um, from International Harvester. And she and her brother were educated at home, and then her brother went to Harvard. Frances growing up was like quite ill. She had like tonsillitis and then her mom took her to the doctor. And when the first doctor prescribed what was basically a very dangerous treatment for the illness, the Glessners, of course, went and sought a second opinion, snaps. And so then Francis underwent a successful surgery. And <sighs> and that was at a time when surgery was like, you know, relatively dangerous in and of itself. But anyway, yeah, she became, she became interested from that in learning more about medicine. Like this whole thing like kind of helped to shape that. And so They would summer in the White Mountains, and local doctors there would allow her to attend home visits with them. And that's how she learned, like, nursing skills, basically. Which, by the way, we love that, like, the family was rich. So they were like, hey, can our daughter just, like, follow you around? (laughs) (laughs) Because this wasn't, like, the time for that for women, right? So, like, anyway. Any hoozles. She then inherits the Harvester fortune. And basically later on, had the money to pursue an interest in how detectives could examine clues using, like, medical legal background. So she was inspired to pursue forensic investigation by one of her brother's classmates. His name was George Burgess McGrath. Um, She became close friends with him, and he was studying medicine at Harvard, Harvard Medical School, and was very interested in death investigation. And so McGrath would actually go on to become a professor in pathology at Harvard Medical School, and a chief medical examiner in Boston. And so with Francis, uh, they would lobby to have coroners replaced by actual medical professionals. Of course, this is still an issue today, right? Coroners, you don't have to be a medical professional to be, in some states, it varies state to state. But anyway, I digress. In 1931, Francis uh, endows the Harvard Department of Legal Medicine, which was the first department in the country of that nature, And her gifts would later establish the George Burgess McGrath Library, um, as well as a chair in legal medicine and the Harvard Seminars in Homicide Investigation. And she also endowed the Harvard Associates in Political Science, which was a national organization for, it was just dedicated to basically furthering forensic science. And there was a division, or there is a division dedicated to her. It's called the Francis Glessner Lee Homicide School. We love it. Ah. So... (laughs) Back to her nutshells a little bit. So 1945, she she like she builds these things, like I said, and then she donates them to Harvard for use in seminars. 
She hosts a series of semi-annual seminars where she presented um, 30 to 40 men with the Nutshell Studies of Unexplained Death, which, as I've mentioned, are just like these very intricately constructed dioramas. Um, and 20 models were based on composites, like I said, of actual cases, and they were designed to test the abilities of students. Um, she, you know, again, she paid close attention to the detail in the models, um, and it's said that each model cost about $3,000 to $4,500 to create. And viewers of these seminars or whatever, they were given 90 minutes to study the scene, and then 18 of the original dioramas were still used for training purposes by Harvard Associates in, in police science back in 1999. And now I said, you know, they're in Baltimore, too. Um, for her work, she was made an honorary captain in the New Hampshire State Police, uh, October 27th, 1943, making her the first woman to join the International Association of Chiefs of Police. Snaps. <sighs> I know. That was an um, intense snap. Holy crap. <laughs> snaps. So... <laughs> Um, there are several different dioramas. Like I've said, there's this three room dwelling, there's a log cabin, there's one known as the blue bedroom, the dark bathroom, a burned cabin, unpapered bedroom, pink bathroom. Like they're all basically just descriptions of what they are. There's a wood, woodsman's shack. There's a saloon and a jail. Like there's all kinds of like crazy shit. Um, and, uh, they were also, like I said, they were once on at, like an exhibit in the Renwick gallery of the Smithsonian American art museum. And in terms of Frances's personal life, in case anybody's wondering about this woman of mystery and what was going on outside of all of this when she had time, L-O-L. But anyway, she marries a lawyer. <gasps> His name was Blewett Harrison Lee. Personally, when I was researching this, I was rooting for her to get with the brother's friend. <laughs> I'm blanking on his name. I literally just said his name and I'm blanking on it. It was a George. George. Anyway, she didn't. That we know of. So she marries this lawyer who's from the family line of General Robert E. Lee. And then she has three children with him. And then the marriage ends in divorce in 1914. Her perfectionism and dioramas, uh, people say, reflect her family background. Her father was an avid collector of very fine furniture uh, with which he furnished the family home. He wrote a book on the subject. And then the family home, which was designed by a man named Henry Hobson Richardson, is now the John J. Glessner House Museum. And the first miniature that she built was of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. And she did so for her mother's birthday. And it was her biggest project at the time. I mean, she was like a kid at the time, but yeah. And she was fond of the stories of Sherlock Holmes. And she loved the plot twists that were often the result of overlooked details. And you can kind of see all of this and how she kind of shaped her life, right? And many of her dioramas would feature female victims in domestic settings, illustrating the dark side of the, quote, feminine roles that she had rehearsed in her married life. Oh. And that, that is Frances Glessner Lee. I love her. I adore her. I think she's so cool. And God bless her and her attention to detail. We love that she got to go on and lecture men at Harvard and yeah, everything else. That. It's wonderful. <laughs> yes. Snaps. We love it. So I was like very proud to read about her. Thank you, listener Emily. We Thank love you, you, Emily. This yeah, was so um, I love this. This is very like, hmm. Hopefully I did old Franny justice, but she, I think, is a very interesting figure. And um, the, the part that's crazy to me is I wrote kind of about back in college when I did my, like, senior thesis, I wrote about kind of the beginnings of forensic science and things like that. And she didn't really come up in anything that I researched. Yeah. Granted, I was focusing more on, like, the forensic anthropology side of things, but even still, like, this should be a figure that's widely talked about. She's should be. Wonderful. Very she much did, so. She did groundbreaking shit yes so, she did yeah but anyway let's hear it for franny good old franny glessner lee also bad badass name love the name big time my grandma's name was francis so as soon as i saw that i was like yes love this yes bitch yeah we love this so anyway thanks again emily that was a blast this was a fun historical episode for i us. love this i love a good history episode yeah this was colorful um so yeah everybody uh you know, if you go visit the Pantages, let us know if you see any ghosty woasties. And um, I'm curious to know if anybody's ever heard about Frances Glessner Lee, honestly, because I, yeah. I didn't know until I looked her up courtesy of Emily. So um, let us know. And of course, until next time, stay strange. Whoops. <laughs>